to thank you, uh, Mary Berry, and I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, following in Professor Berry's uh, uh, footsteps, I want to uh, draw your attention to something I've just written. Um, but it's just an article, but uh, since it's very relevant to what we're talking about today, it's in the current issue of The Nation magazine. It's an article about Lincoln. And there's a lot of baloney being floated around about Lincoln nowadays, particularly in the popular press. If you want to really understand Lincoln, the evolution of his thought, his views on race, slavery, how they changed, take a look at this article, that's all. Um, but Lincoln is, a, we should begin with Lincoln and the new birth of freedom, even though Lincoln obviously was uh, no longer living when the 14th and 15th Amendments were added to the Constitution, because his own, uh, and by the way, let me just ask Professor Berry, I've written so much about this era that I can talk forever, so in, after I'm gone for about five minutes, just nudge my elbow, okay? So I can uh, stop. All right. Um, you know, the, the thing I think we, that, that is interesting about Lincoln in this context, and is really uh, a, a epigrammatic of the whole era of the Civil War Reconstruction, this great crisis out of which the 14th Amendment and really a new constitution emerged, is the way he was able to change over time. The Lincoln of 1865 was a very, very different man than even the one who entered this, the Civil War four years earlier in terms of his views about slavery, race, equality, etc. Uh, in 1862, Lincoln said to Congress, to deal with this tremendous crisis, we must disenthrall ourselves. A wonderful word that you wouldn't hear politicians using today. You know, it's a little too complicated. Disenthrall ourselves. That is, we have to abandon our old ideas and think anew. And in a way, we're in that same situation today. We're in a kind of a crisis, and I hope and expect that President Obama and others will be able to disenthrall themselves from some of the ideas and misconceptions of the past. Um, Lincoln, uh, Lincoln was president when the 13th Amendment was adopted, irrevocably abolishing slavery uh, throughout the country. Um, but uh, I think what's interesting is Lincoln's relationship to the abolitionist movement, which really created, abolitionists weren't really important members of Congress, most of them, etc., but they created the public um, awareness, the consciousness, the public discourse that gave rise to the concept of equality in the Constitution in the 14th Amendment. One abolitionist said that the abolitionist movement was the school of rights. It's the abolitionists who for years, decades, struggled to create the idea of an American citizenry unbounded by the tyranny of race. And despite our uh, admiration for the Founding Fathers, they did not create any such thing. They created a slave-based society in which African Americans enjoyed far, far less rights uh, on, in all ways, even free blacks, of course, uh, not to mention the slaves, than did um, white Americans. Um, but it's in the great crisis of the Civil War and Reconstruction that the abolitionist vision of a country based on this notion of equality beyond race uh, as you know, is written into not only the Constitution, but federal law, like the Civil Rights Law of 1866 and subsequent laws during the Reconstruction uh, era. Um, I'm not a lawyer, certainly not a judge. I can't ex tell people how they should think in lawyer terms. Thank God. All right. <laughs> but, um, but I think the key thing uh, about these Reconstruction era amendments is that Congress intentionally left the language open-ended. There was debate in Congress about whether to list a whole series of rights which everybody ought to enjoy. And John, John Bingham and others who wrote those amendments eventually decided, no, that is not what we should do. Because we might leave some out by mistake. And also, concepts of rights and equality change over time. So they wrote into the Constitution a set of principles, general, vague principles, equal protection, privileges, immunities, etc., on the assumption that future Congresses and future courts would breathe substantive meaning into those concepts as time went on. Of course, our history didn't uh, work out that way. Uh, the courts and the Congresses, etc., uh, began rather quickly to restrict the meaning of those amendments, and we had a long, long period, as, as you all know, well into the 20th century, where uh, the notion of equality for African Americans was uh, fundamentally uh, uh, abrogated or ignored uh, by the courts and the, and the, poli and the politicians. Um, but the one point I want to make is that 
part of that, and only one part, but important, was a misreading of history. You know, the Reconstruction period is, it was for many, many years viewed as sort of the lowest point in American history, corruption, misgovernment, um, because African Americans were given the right to vote. That was the explanation of those older historians. And uh, the, this view of Reconstruction was based on a fundamentally racist view of American democracy and of the capacity or incapacity of African Americans and their inability to participate, really, in American democracy. Now, that view has been overturned long ago. Historians today see Reconstruction as a period of tremendous hope and progress. And um, the tragedy of Reconstruction was not that it was attempted, but that it failed. And this first effort, born of this tremendous crisis, to really uh, give meaning to the idea of equality in America proved to be abortive and was followed by the long uh, uh, nightmare of Jim Crow, disenfranchisement, uh, etc. And it took another century almost for us to again get to the so-called second reconstruction of the civil rights era. But what, all right, now I will stop. My final point is that the Supreme Court hasn't yet learned the new history, even up to this present day. If you read their cases which arise out of uh, the decisions out of 14th Amendment or civil rights law jurisprudence, you will find echoes of that old discredited view of Reconstruction, which helps to create a cramped and I think highly limited view of what the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were all about. So my parting word is, both to the people here and to the nine men and women on the Supreme Court, learn the history of where these amendments came from if you want to really apply them in the spirit uh, in which they were written. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, John Hayden.